Today, we're going to look back at the 80-year history of Seiko Epson, or more commonly known as Epson in our industry. If you own an Epson printer, come take a 10-minute journey with me to discover the fascinating roots and evolution of this innovative technology company. Today, Seiko Epson employs around 77,000 people worldwide with global sales of about $9 billion. But the Epson story starts back in 1942 with nine employees assembling watch parts in a converted Japanese spice warehouse near Nagano, Japan. Hisao Yamazaki, the company's founder, envisioned developing precision instruments to rival Swiss timepieces and began an operation assembling clocks. Yamazaki's passion for establishing a Japanese watch industry led him to collect parts in the late 1940s. If he didn't have certain parts, he made them. By 1946, he had the parts to assemble four timepieces. Only two of the four watches worked, but this would pave the road with an ethos of experimentation that lives on at Epson today. In 1959, the company began full-scale production of wristwatches. That year, the company developed Japan's first originally designed wristwatch called the Marvel. You can get a 1959 Marvel on eBay for about $2,000, and the design still holds up today. 1959 was a pivotal year in the company's history for another reason. In 1959, it was announced that Tokyo would host the 1964 Olympic Games, the first time the Games were to be held in Asia. The company's name at that time was Seiko, and President Soji Hattori was determined that Seiko should handle the official timing duties for the Tokyo Olympics. Olympics officials scoffed that it would not be possible for Seiko to create the required timekeeping devices in the game, as the games were just four years away and Seiko did not have the required experience in sports timing. The Seiko company was undeterred. The lack of history and preconceptions of sports timing from Seiko allowed the staff to view the issues facing timekeepers from a different perspective than established manufacturers. In 1962, the Olympic Technical Committee met at a track and field event to determine the official timer for the Tokyo Olympics. The committee tested the stopwatches by selecting a pair of watches and operating them simultaneously in each hand. They tested the watches for a few seconds, then a few minutes, and finally an hour of operation. When they stopped the watches, they matched perfectly in every case. The committee was very surprised by the performance of the watches and asked for an explanation as to how this had been achieved. At the conclusion of the meeting, the preliminary decision to appoint Seiko as the official timekeeper was made. So what was the explanation of how Epson could provide such precision and accuracy in their timepieces? The answer to that lies in Project 59A, Project 59A would redefine the measurement of time. The secret lies in the second most abundant mineral on Earth, the hard crystal material called quartz. Quartz has some amazing properties. The most important property is that it is piezoelectric. That means that when quartz is compressed or bent, it generates an electric charge on its surface. It also works the other way. If a small electric charge is applied to quartz, it will compress or bend just slightly. This might not sound too special, but it was going to revolutionize the watchmaking profession. This electric charge meant that quartz had an oscillating voltage on its surface. It could oscillate, or repeat a back and forth movement, extremely accurately and for a long time. However, it would stop oscillating eventually. Imagine a bell which creates a ring due to vibrations. The bell is hit, the sound is created, and gradually fades as the vibrations decrease. The timekeeping industry had to find a way to keep the quartz oscillating regularly if it was going to be useful. The industry discovered that using a battery to apply electricity to a quartz circuit would cause the quartz to vibrate at a very specific frequency, 32,768 times each second. Imagine that precision, not 32,767 times each second, 32,768. The circuit counts the number of vibrations and uses those to create an electrical pulse. One pulse for every 32,768 vibrations. One pulse every second. The pulses drive a motor which turns the hands of the clock or watch. In the 1950s and 60s, the size of a quartz clock movement was measured in feet, not millimeters, and no one would dream it could keep time in something the size of a watch. 
the first quartz timepieces that Seiko developed were still the size of table clocks, but the company began entering timepieces in cr chronometer competitions in Switzerland and across the world. After a decade of iteration and innovation in the year 1969, the company introduced the world's first quartz wristwatch, the Seiko Quartz Astron 35SQ. At the time it was launched, the Quartz Astron cost more than a Toyota Corolla. Seiko Epson's innovation and precision was put on display for the world to see at the 1964 Olympic Games, and it was for these games that the company developed its first printing technology. The company invented and developed printing timers used in many of the different events. These printing timers also contain their own quartz timing systems. These were synchronized to an electronic starting pistol. The timer in the printing system would be stopped by sensors at the finish line. The printers could then either immediately print out the results as they occurred or store these in memory and print the results at the conclusion of the race. This sounds so basic now, but it was completely revolutionary in 1964. This printing mechanism was later developed to become the world's first compact, lightweight digital printer called the EP-101. This printer was small enough to fit in the palm of a hand. Moreover, it used 1 20th the power of conventional printers. The EP-101 exceeded expectations, selling nearly 1.5 million units. The EP-101 marked a new era in digital printing and became the foundation for all the Epson printers that you are using today. In fact, the company name Epson came about at this time. The name reflects the desire to create printers that followed in the footsteps of the EP-101, children of the EP, or EP's sons, Epson. Since then, the company has delivered many of these children into the world, and many of you have EP's sons all over your print production floor. Through the 1970s and 80s, Epson mostly developed and sold dot matrix printers. In 1984, Hewlett Packard introduced the first inkjet printer, the Thinkjet, beating Epson to the market by just a few months. This began a technological rivalry that continues to this day. Epson's response to the Thinkjet was the SQ2000. Both of these were black and white printers. It wasn't until the early 1990s that Epson made its inkjet breakthrough that still shapes the entire printing industry to this day. In the 1980s, Epson was developing a novel print head. It had a few dozen tiny reservoirs, each filled with black ink. Each reservoir had a minuscule nozzle with a valve. A plate capped each reservoir. The idea was to push on the plates, deforming them so that they pressed into the reservoirs. Pressure squeezed microscopic drops of ink out of the nozzles and onto the paper. What Epson needed was a precise means of pushing on the plates. If only there was a material that Epson had spent decades mastering that could be electrically pulsed to vibrate 32,768 times a second with perfect precision. Quartz. Epson engineers decided to use piezoelectric quartz material in the print heads as the squeezing mechanism. They put a piezoelectric crystal on the back of every plate that capped each ink reservoir in the print head. When voltage was applied to any individual crystal, it contracted, deforming the plate and pushing out a tiny amount of ink. Precise control of the voltage led to precise control of the deformations, in turn providing unprecedented control of the amount of ink Epson was able to emit for each dot. That level of control led to another great advantage for Epson. HP's printers minimized smearing and blotting by using inks that had been formulated to be very thick. These inks were less viscous than when cold, but would flow well when heated. So the common approach was to use these inks in combination with a head that incorporated a thermal heating element. The downside was that heating gradually degraded the print heads, meaning they would have to be replaced periodically. A benefit of Epson's new micro piezo print head was that it could use almost any ink, including less expensive inks that were more viscous at room temperature. This was possible because the high degree of, of control meant that ink could be dispensed so sparingly that there wasn't enough of it to be smeared on the paper. Because Epson could use inks that did not need to be warmed, it could forego having a heating element in the print heads. Epson's heads weren't subject to thermal degradation and therefore lasted a long time. That meant Epson could build a printer in which the print head was permanent. Mass production of the first micro piezo print head was achieved by the end of 1992. In 1993, the Epson Stylus 800 black and white inkjet printer became the first product equipped with a micro piezo print head. The Stylus 800 had 48 nozzles in a 4x12 configuration and could print 360 dpi dots per inch. The following year, in 1994, 
Epson released its Stylus Color, the world's first high-resolution color inkjet printer, a remarkable innovation at precisely the time that it was needed. Digital cameras were starting to eclipse film, and millions of consumers were accumulating digital photographs that they wanted to be able to print. The micro piezo print head was refined for the stylus color. This one had 64 nozzles and a 16 by 4 configuration. It had a palette of 16 million colors and could print 720 dpi. Epson had also developed new inks that dried very quickly, contributing to better printing control and better print quality. Micro piezo technology was here to stay, and it has continued to evolve. The next generation of heads were dubbed ML chips or multi-layer ceramic. Their piezoelectric elements were less susceptible to damage, which made the heads easier to produce in quantity. These were followed by TFP, thin film piezo print heads, which had the thinnest piezoelectric elements possible. Many of you use TFP print heads in your printers today. Finally, Epson developed precision core print heads, which held the key to higher speed and image quality. Micro piezo print heads not only deliver superb performance, precision, speed, and image quality, but they also operate on low power, making them better for the, for the environment. These features have enabled micro piezo print heads to quickly expand into the commercial, industrial, and office printing segments. Epson's micro piezo print heads have the potential to evolve even further and meet an even wider range of needs. Print heads that are denser and more compact will enable higher image quality at lower cost. Those with more nozzles will be able to print at even faster speeds. Advances like these will allow Epson to provide more reliable commercial and industrial inkjet printers across any number of industries and applications. Epson has vowed to continue innovating and evolving their micro piezo technology into the future, and IT supplies will be right behind them, following this amazing technology company as they introduce new products that transform and improve the way printing is done. If you own an Epson printer, I hope this video gives you some perspective on the 80 years of history and persistent development that have gone into the printer that you're using today. The next time I fire up an Epson printer in our demo center, I'll do it with a greater sense of pride in the company that we represent. I hope you've enjoyed the brief history of Epson. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day.